Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Rob Streisfeld, referred as Doc Rob more often. Um, it's easier than remembering my last name. It is a pleasure to be here today for CD Expo Mountain 2019. This is um, a great opportunity to educate yourselves if you haven't um, before on cannabinoids, cannabis, and the endocannabinoid system. We have a wonderful panel here today. I'm very happy to moderate. The best thing about this is I don't have to talk much. I am a big mouth, I talk a lot, I love this topic, but we have an amazing panel today. So thank you for joining us. And with that, I'm just gonna jump into introductions and then we'll go in, we'll talk a little bit and open some time for Q&A as well. Uh, the, the funny joke that we were talking about before we jumped on was the title of this is The Skinny on the ECS, Endocannabinoid System Functionality. And this system is so amazing and so immense in our body that 45 minutes is really gonna be the thin down skinny version of this topic but it's hopefully going to be a great primer to further investigation and learn more about this. And I think everyone in the market, everyone in the industry globally is still learning more. So as much as we say we know today, there's going to be always something new to learn tomorrow. So with that, I'm going to introduce our panel, uh, starting with Graciela Moreno, owner CEO of La Dolce Vita. Welcome. Thank you. And we have Chip Paul, forensic researcher and endocannabinoid health scientist at New Pharma. Thanks, Hi, everybody. Chip. Yep, nice to meet you guys. And Steve. Kazumi, COO, Precision Plant Molecules, LLC. And the depth of information came from different parts of the country. So, Graciela, please give us a little introduction, if you don't mind, of what got you into this space and a little bit about you know, what's your favorite thing to start with the ECS. Right, so um, a little bit about my background. I actually do come from the cannabis industry. Even though I have a CBD hemp company currently, um, I was in the cannabis marijuana industry, started out in Oregon had some dispensaries there, um, and made the shift from marijuana to hemp, um, essentially to appeal to a bigger audience, and okay. All right. to appeal to a bigger audience and to bring to light um, a lot of uh, the health benefits, not, not only of CBD, um, but everybody that was benefiting from marijuana um, can benefit from hemp. So that's a little bit of my background. And I'm originally from Texas, but I do live here in Denver. Thank you. Chip? Yeah, so uh, my name is Chip Paul. I, I kind of wear two hats. So uh, my wife and I actually are activists in addition to what we do in the field. Um, and we started something in 2014 called Oklahomans for Health, which is the petitioning organization that petitioned the state of Oklahoma in 2014 with a petition I wrote and then we did it again in 2016 with another petition that I wrote that ended up becoming our law and uh, so we've been deeply involved in everything that's going on in Oklahoma um, as activists on the science side uh, we have a company called New Pharma and we forensically research the endocannabinoid system which sounds kind of fancy but it just means I read a lot so I've, re I've read arguably more studies on the endocannabinoid system than anyone in the world um, but, uh, you know, we do deeply study the system and we have some nice university relationships and we're getting ready to write for some grants and we do some cool stuff uh, to learn more deeply about the endocannabinoid. So, uh, favorite thing about the endocannabinoid for me is you have more power in your spice cabinet than you could possibly realize to heal yourself from most things that ail us. Love it. Being a naturopathic doctor and a natural food chef, thank you. <laughs> I love that. Love what you got in the kitchen. Spices, herbs, botanicals in general. It's not just cannabis, but obviously this has opened up the conversation by looking at cannabis as a whole. So, thank you. Steve. Yeah, so my name is Steve Cosme, and I'm the COO of a company here in Denver called Precision Plant Molecules. And I got into the industry for uh, various reasons. Uh, I've been in the natural products industry for nearly 25 years. I've always been an advocate for uh, self-discovery uh, and self-healing. Uh, my background started 25 years ago in a local company. We were a biotech company. We were actually extracting Taxol, which is one of the world's uh, most potent uh, anti-cancer treatments, and we were extracting it from the bark of the yew tree. And now I find myself 25 years later, and we're implementing the same technologies, the same science, uh, and um, when I saw that this was uh, opening up, I, I really wanted to get into the industry to really bring a lot of the uh, 
uh, legitimization of the industry from an um, operations standpoint, bringing in the GMPs, and then also bringing in um, the science to how you manufacture these uh, really powerful medicines um, to the general public. And I think the, one of the most interesting facts I, I can state real quickly about the, the, e, the UCS is that it was, it was only discovered in 1993. And so as we sit here and we know that um, medical advancement is happening at an unbelievable rate, but to, to know that there's something about our human body that regulates so many of our daily functions from sleep to appetite to mood, and we only discovered it in 1993. And so when you go to your doctor now and you talk about this, they're still gonna look at you a little bit perplexed. And so that's why we're here today is to, uh, to bring some of that education out to the, mass, the masses. Awesome. That's a really great point. I mean, this is a new field. So before we dive into some of the details and the science and some of the other attributes, I know we're in Colorado, which is, again, the forefront of the cannabis movement, but how many people today is this new to them? Can you just raise your hand? If the endocannabinoid system is a new thing, first time you're hearing about it or learning about it, it's okay. That's, that's why we're here, is to educate. So for many of you guys, and thank you guys for coming for the first time, but for many of you have some familiarity, right? So, going to different conferences and looking at different, we have different levels of research. You have, our, you know, PhD research, the ICRS, uh, you guys are the International Cannabinoid Research Society. That's a great focus, and a lot of the research has been going still on mice and you know things of that nature. Very few are still human trials, but from what we want to look at, it, or one of my questions is, you have over 500 compounds in the cannabis plant. We talk about not just cannabis affecting the endocannabinoid system. So where do you see this going as part of the future of medicine as a whole? We have a big 30,000 square foot, you know, 30, you know, foot shot first. Where does this endocannabinoid system fit going forward, looking ahead five years, 10 years? Um, Chip, what are you thinking of, of how this looks like? <laughs> a hot seat day? That's what the panel's all about. Hot seat, so. No, this is that's a it's a really good question, and, and let me let me kind of frame this up in in a way that a physician might view something that's wrong with you. So let's pick something: uh, obesity. Okay, <clears throat> so you go into your doc now, and you say you're obese, right? So I need to lose weight. You know, I'm having heart problems, whatever. It's affecting my life. Can't exercise anymore. The doc's going to go to his PDR or his education, and he's going to look at obesity, and it's going to say you kind of have a weakness, right? So it's, it's going to be, really be a judgment on that person. Um, again, there are medications that will work for that. He'll probably prescribe you medications, but you know, he's going to judge you based on lack of exercise and probably lack of willpower, and that's bad. That's wrong. But anyway, so he's going to make a determination, and he's going to prescribe you a medication based on that diagnosis. Let's look at that in a little different way, okay? So what, if you look at obesity as an endocannabinoid condition, a dysregulation, again, the endocannabinoid, probably our master regulatory, what's it regulate? Everything, does it regulate how we feed and crave, how we eat? Absolutely. So what does obesity look like now under these different eyes? Well, it looks like inflammation. I mean, that's pretty much it. I mean, we're allergic to most everything that we eat so it looks like a lot of inflammation and our inability to mediate that inflammation in our gut. And are there products that work for that? THCV is a pretty good product that works for that. CBDs are a pretty good product that work for that. Quercetin is a pretty good product that works for that. Curcumin and turmeric is a pretty good product that works for that. And guess what? They're all safe. They're all safe. They will not hurt you. So, so we see that you know, as a naturopathic doctor, my training was to prevent disease, right? To find the underlying dysfunction and cause of imbalance or dis-ease of the body. And if we all have, all humans, animals, I deal a lot with animals and dogs these days with CBD. If we all have this system, then the idea is to find homeostasis or balance this endocannabinoid system. And looking at a Chinese medicine model, we have yin and yang, right? Gas and break go and stop. And it looks like the endocannabinoid system has this you know, system going on through it. So how plants or how substances or how your own body reacts to this gas or break option is really going to tell a lot of people about how you get healthier. Some people's gas pedal is down to the floor all the time. 
That's part of our society, part of our stresses. So how do we look at this from a different perspective and how do we look at molecules and to interact with that system? Steve, any thoughts on how this endocannabinoid system, I mean, first of all, let's break down endo. Let's back up a second, because endo is, I think, the biggest missing component of conversation. It's what our own body produces, right? So how does it look for the body when it looks at the endocannabinoids, and how do we automatically take care of our endocannabinoids? Forget about CBD or cannabis for a second. How does our own body support this system? Well, so one of the main functions is, uh, in my opinion, through the sleep cycle, the natural um, uh, circadian rhythms. Um, that plays in with the relationship between serotonin. Uh, we do know that uh, cannabinoids can have effect on serotonin receptors. So I do believe that one of the first ways that your body uh, starts to protect itself uh, with the endocannabinoid system that can, that can do is through the, the, the sleep cycle. And then the next is then uh, the cravings and that what we are uh, desired and pleasured by eating. So two, two you know, 24, seven a day, sleep or eating. Yeah, I think that's great. When I went to finish school, became a doctor, I then went to culinary school. And everyone's looking at me like, what, you're gonna become a cook? You're a doctor. Or, no, 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 let's talk. Because I think everyone here, we may have differences in opinion, we have differences in lifestyle, but everybody eats. So when you start talking about your digestive health and what you put in your body, that's a, you know, a factor that affects all of us more than once a day, typically, on a regular basis. So I think that's great that we, we put it in our body and how we regulate that is really key. And our body reacts. So our body is something that this our, will produce our own chemicals, our own cannabinoids, our anandamide, which those that don't know breaks down to be our bliss molecule to help us feel good. So, um, Gracia, what are some of the other thoughts of besides, again, I'm trying to slow down on just taking a, a substance or a pill or a product. What are some of the other things that are, from your understanding that has supported the endocannabinoid system, in addition to good sleep and eating, that support this balance and producing more anandamide. Perhaps. Right. Well, I agree with both of the panels up here is that, um, you know, having a more holistic approach to health um, in general and starting out with the diet, and like, um, you know, they said up here is that having different herbs, and you mentioned turmeric. Uh, turmeric is really big supplement because you know we're finding out that there are uh, very many health benefits to that as well um and it just so happens that you know cbd uh is becoming the next best best thing and cbd i think is also opening the gateway um for physicians and for scientists and for uh researchers to start researching and making a more holistic approach to medicine uh, much like eastern medicine um, rather than how we do. We just give you a pill and sedate it instead of actually taking care of the whole person. Yeah, that whole person concept, there's been a study that showed that basic therapeutic lifestyle change, exercise, meditation, good sleep cycles, um, acupuncture, there's so many things that naturally stimulate and support your own endocannabinoid system's tone or health. And I think that's really important. I think that as much as you know, this topic is really the skinny on the ECS because it's not just here, take this pill or take this product. Those are supplements or supporters to your actions. And so I think a real takeaway for me in this panel and our conversation today is there are many things you can do. And there are many other substances, natural products, herbs, and nutri nutrients that can support that. As a doctor, one of my biggest things when I talk to people is cortisol, circadian rhythm. Right? We have this rhythm, this flow, it kind of goes with that yin and yang. And it's so common when I talk to people, we do adrenal stress tests, we do cortisol tests, that this is dysfunction, this is in dis-ease. And so for people that understand that the CBD has been helping to balance your cortisol response, your cortical steroids, this is really key to getting long-term health. Now people today, I, listen, there's an acute condition there are definitely been factors. If someone has uh, seizures and epilepsy, we've seen that with a good quality product that gets into the bloodstream and gets into the receptors quickly, it has an immediate acute effect. Mm -hmm. But I think what people should also look for is this long-term well-being. 
You know, that's been my platform, is better living. It's not what you're feeling today, it's how you're going to feel for the next year, three years, five years, the rest of your life. And I think that's really, for me, part of what's exciting about understanding this endocannabinoid system, that this is an amazing foundational understanding to improve your well-being, regardless of your health condition, whether it be seizures or cancer, inflammation, insomnia, it doesn't really matter. Those are, I think, secondary or tertiary to getting this underlying system. So. That being said, we have receptors all over the place. So, who wants to jump in about the CBD receptors or CB receptors? I'm sorry. I'm happy to, or I will. Nice. But, but, it, but you basically, so again, what, as you mentioned, endocannabinoid system. So, what does this mean? I mean, it's an internal system inside of us that these external things affect, right? So, CBDs affect it, natural products affect it, THC affects it. Temperature affects it, pressure affects it, a whole lot of things. If, ever want to know why bariatric beds work? They work kind of because of action of the endocannabinoid system that can be affected by pressure. It'll cause an inflammatory response. It'll cause an immune response. But anyway, you have CB1 neuroreceptors. Your CB1 neuroreceptors are primarily engaged by anandamide, which is your internal main ligand in the endocannabinoid system. You also have another side that's more related to cannabidiol, kinda. It used to be thought that cannabidiol modulated it directly, but we know that that doesn't happen now. But it's something called your CB2 neuroreceptor, and it's modulated inside of you called, with something called 2-arachnoglyic acid, or 2-AG. But again, these are the main knobs and levers, as Dr. Rob was saying, on how this system works. And it works in a push, pull, off, on, up, down, energized, de-energized, flip on, flip off fashion, exactly like he said, but it uses these two major ligands to work us. Right. Now there's also a study on one of the bigger issues or big issues in our country, mental health, depression, SSRIs, very common drugs prescribed on a regular basis. And they did research showing that those were given SSRIs are not usually given them for a short period to treat an acute issue. They're usually given in long-term chronic doses. So keep taking it. Keep taking it forever. And the study showed that these SSRIs would hit the same receptors and would block the body's ability to produce anandamide. So what you're doing is you're giving yourself a drug to treat depression and causing your body to be more depressed. So the more you took the SSRIs and you got onto this and you're in this cycle and you're locked in, you could not get feel better because you're actually telling your body, hey, stop producing this anandamide, this bliss molecule. It, 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 can I just jump yeah. in could, could, to support that point? It, it, one of the first things that pharma did, you know, 19, I guess the late 90s, um, when the endocannabinoid system was first discovered, they said, what would happen if we blocked your CB1 neuroreceptor, which would basically if, it, it, it deny you your ability to process anandamide, exactly like what Dr. Rob was talking about. And they came up with a drug called renombin, and renombin blocked your CB1 neuroreceptor. It was great for weight loss, great strategy for weight loss. If you can calm down CB1 in the gut, great for weight loss. Worked great. People lost weight like crazy. They just committed suicide. Literally. So they had people in the trials commit suicide, everybody reported depression, and they shut down the clinical trial. Yeah. yeah. And again, we, this is not something new. Maybe we've discovered this new, but we've been passing along anandamide and these endocannabinoids through breast milk, you know, through this part of the mother-child relationship through nature. And um, I'm a big fan of when to get into some of the other compounds in a second that interact with the endocannabinoid system. But one of my favorite guys is, is Dr. William Courtney. And he's a little bit out there, but if you haven't you know, read up on him, he's all about the whole plant, the raw plant, the, the acids. Before we take this pro these plants, and today there's amazing companies out here, there's a lot of great products that are working, but nearly all of them, not all of them, but nearly all of them feel it's necessary to heat, which changes the, the form and function of these compounds in order to be effective in our human body. And he made a comment once on a call with me and said, what about that 200 pound deer? The 200 pound deer walks around the forest, has an endocannabinoid system, and knows instinctively to grab that plant that used to grow feral and all over the place, now not so much, and nibble on a few leaves and a little bud. And that would support that huge animal's endocannabinoid system. So I just want to put that out there in the context of concentrating in the high, high doses of these, these compounds, of decarboxylating these compounds, Sometimes just stop and think that the nature 
was there and our bodies are there and somehow this could interact on its own in that natural way. I just want to kind of address that because we're so quick to think more is better and supersize me and this is strong, that that's not always the case when it comes to how the body heals. So sometimes less is actually better than more. So and That's where microdosing also comes in. I was just going to say, talking about like going to some of the products <laughs> or how to talk to people about how we get started with these products and how to support the endocannabinoids in the products isn't always take the biggest, strongest, right. most potent product that you can find in order to be effective. Right, right, exactly. Um, yeah, microdosing, um, I'm sure the majority of you guys uh, know what it is, um, but it's basically taking a smaller dose um, more often throughout the day than taking a large dose um, maybe twice a day um, to, to help sustain the endocannabinoid system. And there's been studies, and even anecdotally from some of my um, some of, some of my customers um, that are saying that microdosing actually has helped them quite a bit more than taking the larger dose one time a day or two times a day because they're getting a gradual amount throughout the day. Um, and, it, and, and it helps their endocannabinoid system, um, for lack of a better word, digest and absorb um, and uh, start to heal continually throughout the day. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a key point. When I was, years ago, starting to introduce CBD, to, even to doctors, how do we do this? Now, it's challenging, because the healthcare paradigm is this amount for this kilogram weight, for this condition and this symptom, and we're all different. Everyone is different. What you, if you were breastfed as a child, if you experimented with cannabis in college, if you do yoga, I mean, all these things could impact your own body's levels, receptors. We're talking about CB1, CB2, Locking keys, this is all independent. So it's typically recommended to start at a low dose, right? And slowly build up. And we found, you know, sometimes young people need higher doses where elderly need lower doses. You know, and so and some people, I've had people take CBD and then take a little bit and get, go right to sleep. Like they just get knocked out. And someone can take a, a ton of it and not feel anything. So. Oh, it doesn't work. Well, that's not always true. <laughs> How your body is responding is a big factor to that. So one of the things that we're talking about, your history goes back to cancer and cancer medications and understanding mechanisms. And this is interesting to watch doctors and the medical community, the scientific community, work backwards now, saying, hey, we understood this mechanism, or we thought we understood this this way with this drug, and now they have a whole new approach. They have a whole new paradigm to reflect. So what are some of the things that you're seeing in, in, in correlation? You said it kind of 25 years forward. What are some of the comments that you're seeing in industry and how this is moving forward, maybe even for cancer treatment, if that's something you're comfortable with? Yeah, so I think that uh, talking about uh, why we're seeing the, these type of products are, are effective, first of all, I think that um, we, were, we were talking before we, we sat here with you guys, and uh, there, we all believe that uh, we're all deficient in these cannabinoids. And this deficiency is not just with us, it's, it's, a, it's been a long standing deficiency. And the belief is that uh, these cannabinoid plants, along with other plants that we mentioned today, like pepper and um, turmeric, and there's, there's 20 others, that we've historically, we've been, they've been intimate with us. We cook with them. Uh, we would, you know, use them for salves and balms, you know, we're talking about, you know, very long ago. But then there was a real sharp break, and that break has been, you know, say over the last maybe 100 or 200 years where the, this uh, prohibition on the cannabis. And so, so we're seeing that we're, our bodies are deficient. And so this gets back to like the microdosing that you were mentioning, is the reason that there's belief that that microdosing is actually beneficial rather than always just hitting that huge dose is that because your body actually as you as you were stating your body can actually make your own cannabinoids right and if you're constantly hitting it with that the big dose then sometimes your body actually turns off and says well i don't need to make more and now you get this really wacky up down cycle again so that may be why the the microdosing is is really going to be a, a way to treat um, and so then you can start to talk about treating things that, you know, traditional Western doc doctors are trying to, uh, again, treat with like uh, one or two big doses or 
um, you know, like you were saying, long term, but those doses are still la large and they're long term treatments. And yeah. so, so I do think that this is a shift. And again, uh, you know, a lot of this is just to get people to have that dialogue with your physician, right? And so, if you are having that depression or some chronic issue, that you start to ask these questions and maybe you'll have that one doctor that'll pick up the, a, a paper and will be more open to these type of discussions. Yeah. Can, can yeah. I grab the cancer room? Yeah, jump on cancer. Okay, just, just, just real quick because I think, again, it's, it's different. <laughs> so um, traditional medicine, the way that traditional medicine attacks cancer is with chemotherapy. And chemotherapy, the way that that works is it tries to really disrupt how cells eat, I guess, for lack of a better word. It's trying to break down the exoskeleton in cells. And chemotherapy, most chemotherapy, most people don't realize this, chemotherapy comes from plants. Almost every drug that we have comes from plants, but you know, most of it from vink alkaloids, from periwinkle plants. So if you grow periwinkles, you're growing chemo drugs, literally in your backyard or whatever. So, but that's the way traditional medicine has attacked cancer. Now, if you look, again, if you look with, put on your endocannabinoid glasses, what does cancer look like? Well, it looks different. It looks different, really, than the way traditional medicine views it. And it looks almost like if you have a bruise, like if you have a bruise in your immune system, that bruise on the boundary cells will excrete 2-AG, which is your, an internal endocannabinoid. So it looks to be the signaling, a signaling molecule that just kind of says, leave me alone, right? The immune system has me, you know, I'm under, I'm being repaired, all good, leave me alone. Cancer does the same thing. So the cancer at the boundary cells will over excrete 2-AG, which is an endocannabinoid. But again, it looks like the traditional medicine, you know, works occasionally. The endocannabinoid way to get at cancer, though, is a hard CB1 hit because you have to fight through that signaling, right? You have all this 2-AG, the opposite, basically, signal, and you have to fight through that opposite signal and give that cell a CB1 hit. When you do that, you can readdress the cell, and the cell dies, right? So that's kind of the way cancer works under endocannabinoid, and the, and the strategies of cancer have to do with oversaturation, really, Rick Simpson oil, you know, of THC. And another thing, just real quick about cannabis, cannabis and CBDs like to affect us globally, right? So they affect us whole person. Natural products like to go at things. So like a, something like a milk thistle would have a similar action to CBDs, but it would go at your liver, right? So there's ways to kind of finally get at things, but cancer's hard. And the whole reason for saying that is again, if you have cancer in a difficult place in your body and you're using an endocannabinoid strategy, you have to just, completely oversaturate your body to get those resources to drag to that particular organ or whatever so yeah yeah thank you this is um i've always said to people you everyone has had cancer cells in their body at any in your lifetime there will be cancer cells in your body it's how your body is prepared to react to that and protect it and that goes again right to the beginning of sleeping and allowing the body to repair itself and sorts out damages it's your diet how much stress you put on the body how much inflammation on your body so we have this endocannabinoid system where we have our own production. We have phytocannabinoids, which are our external plant-based support that we're starting to learn more and more about and how we utilize that cohesively. And then I always like to say there's still dietary cannabinoids. They're not necessarily, they're still kind of plants, but they're part of your diet versus just a supplement. So there's a lot of opportunity here for us to get you know, healthier by understanding this endocannabinoid system. And that's really the key here is foundational. And there's an interaction, there's a relationship between THC and CBD. As I said, yin and yang. And some people are saying, well, I only want CBD because I don't want the high, the euphoria, the disorientation. And um, I have to say from experience that sometimes that's therapeutic. I always say this in my talks. I always say that sometimes the high is what the patient needs. And I say that in a very honest way, when someone is you know, terminally ill, dying with cancer, and I've seen this with my mom, so, and I can give her a little bit, an hour of relief and lightness and euphoria, that may not be what you want as an individual, but she needed it. And that's something I tell people, for all those people that fight CBD only or are totally against THC, you're missing the big picture. This is all part of the plant and the plant works together. Now I've had patients go, um, go to a doctor who maybe wasn't as educated and they did not have the 10 milligram CBD capsule that the patient required, or the THC, I'm sorry. They didn't have a, a THC only no CBD, and they didn't have a 10, they didn't have a 25, they had a 50. 
<laughs> so they gave it to me. Oh no. This is a 70 year old woman that was given a 50 milligram THC capsule by a doctor and then for the next seven hours is throwing up and nauseous and on the floor and that's malpractice in my opinion but they don't they, they can't hold you against it because they're still oh we're just learning we don't know well you should know that that's not balanced but i do say that when we have those situations cbd would often bring that down would kind of almost act as an antidote to that uncomfortable t over thc we've also seen and i do this with a lot of people you know and i'm going not trying to attack thc but Talking about cannabis as a whole, science has said, unless you have a medical condition that requires it, we typically want, especially THC, people to be 18 years of older or older so that their brain can be developing. And I've seen this firsthand. We have young people get very excited about cannabis being available, and they're taking these high concentrated products, and they're dabbing, and they're doing concentrates of high potency, and it may seem cool, but you're really, just like we we're talking about, putting too much in the system, you're actually putting that gas to the pedal so much you're burning out the engine, you're burning off the tires, you're, and people are starting to get ill from too much concentrate. So again, I love this context, I love the panel talking about smaller doses and starting to build up your overall balance, and don't forget all the other things that you can do to support your endocannabinoid system that's not necessarily just taking cannabis products. That's even again, the rage of kale, the dark green leafy vegetables, it's all stuff that helps us feel better, and maybe we don't know why, but it does. So. Um, with that, I just want to open up. I know we talked a lot of science stuff, and there's a lot of, we could talk for hours this panel. So I'd love to open it up for any questions from the audience. This is really for you guys to learn. We obviously have some understanding, but we'd love for you guys to get some more information. So basically, it's, it sits above your central nervous system and function. I guess I like to kind of think about it in terms of umbrellas, right? So that it sits, you know, it's a higher umbrella than your central nervous system. And, it, and we know that for several reasons. It fires more basic, it fires different, it doesn't work really like your central nervous system. It kind of does, but it doesn't, right? But there's all of these crossovers. And so right now there's a lot of current studies talking about, you know, crossover at CB1 and, you know, your serotonin system or dopamine system. So how do they work together and interplay? Again, that's resources, right? So if you're wanting to balance your dopamine and serotonin system, you have to have enough dopamine and serotonin first, right? But, but then you have to have enough endocannabinoid resources to work those systems. It's always about, you have a computer in your body, you have a hypothalamus hippocampus, and it's always using the endocannabinoid to try to balance everything and manage everything, but it needs gas, right? It has to have resources, and we're just really beginning to understand what those resources are. But put it this way, if you have a disease of dysregulation, again, that's addressable in the endocannabinoid. So a lot of people out there think, I'm depressed. I'll always do, be depressed. I, there's never any solution for me. I'm screwed. Not so, not in probably our world, right? Because it, that could be, you could just have scurvy and just need vitamin C, right? And it's literally that simple. Anyone else have a point on that? Or? So I, I want to jump in if you don't mind, because this is something that's really dear to me. When I started, I was sick as a kid. Most healers get into this because they're only their personal health or their family or friends. And I was just sick with, I had cystic acne in through high school and college, digestive issues. They wanted to put me on antacids in seventh grade for an ulcer. And they said, I said, how long, doc? They said, what do you mean? I said, when do I get off this? They said, we don't know. And it was said because there's no real understanding. So I spent the first part of my career doing digestive health. So many people today know probiotics, right? You've heard of the term probiotics already at this point? Well, when I started about 18, 20 years ago, I'd go to rooms filled like this and go, probiotic, and nobody knew what I was talking about. Just like we're learning about different cannabinoids and different terms in cannabis. Now everyone knows about probiotics, but the gut health, this micro world of organisms, about 70% of the serotonin that you need in your body gets produced in the digestive system as part of the byproducts of a healthy environment and healthy bacteria, okay? So we found that a large portion of the CB2 receptors are located in the digestive tract. 
and there's communication between the bacteria and the receptors and the digestive health and the inflammation and the cortisol production. So when you get, goes back again, back to the gut, as you get the digestive health working, you eat clean food, you add in your probiotics, and that could be from sauerkraut or kimchi and yogurt, it doesn't have to be just another pill, I'm talking about food as medicine, that that starts to get your internal environment healthier and balanced, and that then helps to send up the right serotonin levels, the right support. You know, I want to just, off that, people would say coconut oil is great for liver, your liver health, great, your coconut oil, coconut oil, coconut oil. Why is coconut oil, why is MCT oil used in a lot of these products? No that we're using today. <laughs> well, in fact, coconut oil has two compounds, caprylic and lauric acids in them. And these are antifungal and antibacterial compounds. So what they were doing was they were actually giving coconut oil to the system. This was good for thyroid health too, right? They said, oh, it's great for thyroid health, coconut oil. And stuff. No one explained why. The reaction is that there was an enzyme that converts inactive thyroid hormone into the active thyroid hormone that was being blocked by bacteria, by fungus. So by giving coconut oil, you would, you would push down the fungal levels, the candida, the bacteria, and would allow more of that enzyme to be activated, which would make your thyroid work more functional. Your thyroid was fine, but the medical system only saw thyroid dysfunction in the lab and didn't understand the underlying mechanisms of why it wasn't working properly. So this is what we're looking at now, is that we're going deep in to this endocannabinoid system and this underlying regulatory mechanism that helps us find balance and also all these other little triggers that could support that tone. So I hope that kind of helps a little bit in that. Because when I got my gut fixed, believe me, I'm a happy guy. <laughs> I mean, I, I get joked around all the time, I was smiling all the time, and it wasn't that. I didn't even realize the cloud that was over my head of depression back in those days, because I was so distracted by the, the vein or the, the, the visible pain or issues I was having. And when that was gone, then I said, oh, wow, I'm a happy guy, and now my bliss molecules are producing like crazy. And that's what I think that anandamide is there, the serotonin is there, and that's why the ECAS, in regards to the products and the different compounds, this is foundational to understand, and we're going to continue to learn more about it. So. Anyone else have a question? Okay, that's a good question. So the question was, for those that didn't hear, was, yes, there's CBD out there, cannabidiol, in multiple forms. Full spectrum, which we'll call everything the plant contains. Broad spectrum, which is kind of an industry term that will basically look at everything but perhaps THC, because that's what they're looking to avoid. And then isolate, which will be just the CBD molecule alone and nothing else. And yes, there's a difference between them. Does anyone want to jump in? On a product side, or because yeah. well, the fact is, how does it affect? Is it different? I mean, we're just really trying to understand it. For me, I was an anti-isolate guy because I'm a holistic doctor. I'm a whole food guy, but then I started to find applications where isolate might be beneficial, right? Maybe in health conditions where they needed high levels of CBD, but not some of the other compounds, right? Or I have situations where perfect occupation may be a factor. And even the broad spectrums, how, how confident are we that there has no THC in there that might trigger a, a drug test? So for my professional athletes, my military, my air flight, my pilots, I might have to say, look, an isolate might be your safest option. Now, from an effectiveness standpoint, that's the key, right? Does it work the same? Does it functionally work the same? And I'm a big fan of the terpenes. I'm a big fan of flavonoids. I'm a big fan of other compounds in this plant that all play in to receptors and these different, you know, locking keys and so forth. So for me, we're talking about what condition are we looking at? Are we talking about the day-to-day -day better living, healthy lifestyle? I'm a full spectrum guy. Everything the plant offers in that sense. But if you're talking about individual disease treatment or condition treatment, which most people shouldn't be really focusing on, the health community needs to learn more about that, that's where I, I see a lot more application of maybe some more isolated Isolates. ones. I think the bigger question or the next question I would, that transitions to that is synthetics or how does that transition? Like for me, we have you know, B vitamins grown on yeast in, in labs. We have different compounds being grown off of yeast cultures and so forth. Synthetic compounds being manufactured in order to meet 
supply demand, you know, demands. Now, does that resonate with the human body, you know, as well as, you know, the, the plant in its natural form? I will tell you that from a natural supplement guy, we all know ascorbic acid, vitamin C. Well, ascorbic acid came out as the new, better, best vitamin C because you can't eat enough oranges. But what they found is it didn't work as well until they added back in the rose hips and the bioflavonoids and the things that the plant had in its original form. So yes, can the isolate be useful in certain conditions? Yeah, but if we have the freedom to access the plant in its natural form, in its whole form, that's where I'm leaning towards always. That's just my response. I would, I would absolutely agree with that as well. Um, but I also want to throw out there hemp flower. Um, hemp flower is also available in certain states. I think uh, certain states it's still legal. Um, but hemp flower as well is uh, cold plant therapy. Um, so, you, I mean, you were kind of talking about adding heat yeah. and everybody thinking that you have to add heat and it has to go through a process. But if you also have whole plant, you know, bud that you could smoke, and that's also a whole plant as well. But also from a products um, and market point of view, I would agree with, with the doctor as well, is that um, my products for my brand are isolated. And that's all that I produce. Um, I do firmly believe in the whole plant therapy, um, which is uh, hemp bud and full spectrum. But most of my market and clientele are people that are finding an introduction to him or, or on their pathway towards discovering him or our blue collar or construction workers, law enforcement. My nephew just went to the Air Force and has you know severe anxiety. Um, and so he started on the isolate and passes, I mean passes test. Um, so I think that that's also a way to introduce people to him and to their natural and to the health benefits as well as through isolate, but I, I, I agree with the whole plant therapy at the end of the day. Nice. And I know we're running out of time. And, um, I just want to say, and I'm going to get to your question in one sec, is that I, I always use this reference, and just to think about this, is that I, I'm a big fan of tobacco, the plant. <laughs> but I'm not a big fan of tobacco industry. I'm a big fan of cannabis in all its glory, but I have concerns about the cannabis industry. Tobacco was used, the raw plant, the leaves, were used topically to treat skin cancers, effectively. It was used in gum health in India. It still is in some toothpaste formulations. But when the industry gets involved and you start to manipulate it and start to, you know, try to commoditize it and commercialize it and so forth and then add other things and compounds, look, that's what we're seeing now is that we're trying to meet the growing consumer demand and having black market and, you know, sketchy products getting out there that's what I want to say is that the plant is always going to be there for you. The plant is from nature. The plant is safe. It's the industry that we have to always keep in check and regulate in a proper way. And so I just want to throw that out there because everyone looks at me like I'm crazy. I say I like tobacco. I'm not smoking cigarettes, but I don't have a problem with that. There's a lot of plants I've experimented in smoking flowers. I did passion flower. I smoked avena or oats in the years because that's there's so many powerful plants that are out there that could be beneficial. Hops obviously we know has a relationship with hemp and it works and it triggers certain endocannabinoid system. So get that IPA and, 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 and use some hemp. And some people it affects differently. You know, right now, some people get, take an IPA and get a headache and want to go to bed. A similar reaction than they do when they get CBD. So just to let you know that there is that correlation in all the plant kingdom. You have a question? We have to wrap up, but I want to get one last one. It's not intentional, I don't think. I think a lot of these companies are not. But you get a quick education. I've been teaching at CBD for close to five years right now, and people weren't familiar with CBD. And the terminology, the, 
these full spectrum, broad spectrum. That's why I quoted them because broad spectrum is really an industry term. It's not an accepted medical or scientific term at this stage of this industry. Till the FDA steps in and puts certain guidelines in, till there's regulatory framework around these compounds and industry, it's still going to be a lot of this misinformation. I can tell you that I went around uh, a state and I looked at the medical and patient education material at dispensaries, and they all use the same core material initially. And now, years later, they're starting to differentiate where even sativa versus indica is starting to get pushed down, not even as common, you know, common language, to being more focused on a terpene dominant effect than just so if you have, you know, high mercy might be more that indica calming, sleepy feeling, whereas maybe a limonene, you know, uh, you know, compound might be more exciting or pinene might be more uh, stimulating. They're not talking indica sativa anymore just in the, in the, in the framework, they're talking about does it have CBN, CBC? And that's where we're still in the early stages, which again, I applaud everyone for coming to the show this, uh, this weekend. Thank you, the panelists, for coming and joining us and sharing information. Uh, there's a lot more talks, great questions. Thank you, guys. I wish we had another couple hours, but we'll be around. And <laughs>